is VOA1, The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. On today's program, Katie Weaver and I have a story on the rising interest in long-lasting birth control among American teenagers. John Russell is here to present this week's science report. We close the show with the next part of our U.S. history series. But first, for about a year, 16-year-old Adismaris Abreu had been thinking about the possibility of getting a long-lasting birth control device. She was seeking a solution to her increasing pain during her monthly menstrual period. Then in June, the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. The ruling ended a 50-year-old legal right to abortion nationwide. Abortion is a medical procedure to end a pregnancy. Abreu joined a growing number of young women rushing to their doctors as states began to ban or severely limit abortion. I'm definitely not ready to be pregnant, Abreu said. Her home state of Florida bans most abortions after 15 weeks. She decided in August to have a contraceptive device put into her arm. Experts say the Supreme Court's ruling appears to be adding to the movement of increased use of birth control devices and medication among teenagers. The nonprofit Reproductive Health Organization, Planned Parenthood, has been flooded with questions about birth control. Doctors across the country have reported rising demand for birth control even among teenagers who are not sexually active. Some patients are especially fearful because the new abortion laws in several states do not include exceptions for sexual attack. Please, I need some birth control in case I get raped, patients tell Dr. Judith Sims Senden. She is a gynecologist for young women and girls in Miami, Florida. The state does not provide exceptions to abortion for rape if the pregnancy is beyond 15 weeks. Sim Senden said parents who might have been resistant in the past now want to discuss birth control as a choice for their daughters. It's a sea change of, I don't have room to play. We have got to get my child on something. Sim Senden said. Teenagers were already switching to more effective, long-acting forms of birth control before the June ruling, said Laura Lindbergh. She is a professor at Rutgers University's School of Public Health in New Jersey. Her research found the number of 15 to 19 year olds using such birth control methods rose to 15 percent during the period of 2015 to 2019. That is up from 3 percent during the 2006 to 2010 period. No national data is available for the months since Roe was overturned, Lindbergh said. But she said, major ripple effects are expected from the loss of abortion availability in many states. After the High Court's ruling, Missouri was among the first states in the country to put a law in place banning abortion at any point in pregnancy. 
Dr. David Eisenberg practices medicine in the state. He said he has seen a sense of urgency from college-aged women to have the most effective birth control choice. They understand the consequence of a contraceptive failure might mean they become a parent because they might not be able to access an abortion, Eisenberg said. Interest is also high at a health center that Dr. Elise Berlin oversees in Columbus, Ohio. Before the Supreme Court's decision, the center could make appointments for new patients within a week or two. Now they are reserving appointments several months in advance. The demand is so high that the center is adding another doctor, said Berlin. The growing interest exists even in states like North Carolina, where abortion remains legal. The state's legislature, however, is conservative. This means state leaders are more likely to attempt to pass a ban on abortion in the future. Dr. Kavita Arora is a gynecologist in the North Carolina city of Chapel Hill. She said she has been seeing many more teenage patients than before the overturn of Roe. They're aware that this is an incredibly fluid situation, and what is allowed at one moment may not be allowed a week or a month later, said Aurora. That unclear future is part of what led Adis Maris Abreu to seek out her new birth control device which can prevent pregnancy for up to five years. I don't know what's going to happen with the laws in that time period, Abreu said. Having this already in my arm, it makes me feel so much safer. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Katie Weaver. Next is this week's science report. John Russell tells us about the new space race between the United States and China. Listen closely. After we hear his report, John will have a question for you to help test your understanding of the story. The United States and China are increasingly competitive in space as both nations plan to put people back on the moon and establish the first moon bases. NASA, the U.S. space agency, is waiting for a new launch date for its Artemis I mission. It is expected this month or next. Technical problems led to cancellations of the first two launch attempts in recent weeks. China aims to send astronauts to the moon within ten years and establish a robotic research station there. Both the U.S. and China plan to establish bases for intermittent crews on the moon's south pole after that. The efforts come fifty years after U.S. astronauts closed the doors on an Apollo spacecraft and left the moon for Earth in December of 1972. No one has visited the moon since. Some space policy experts question if the world is seeing another international space race. They note major differences, however, from the earlier space race between Russia and the U.S. This time, both the U.S. and China see moon programs as part of a larger plan for exploring, settling, and possibly using resources offered by the moon, Mars, and space at large. American intelligence, military, and political leaders make clear they see strategic challenges to the U.S., in China's space program. On the military side, the U.S. and China trade accusations of weaponizing space. There is also a civilian side to the efforts. 
The U.S. is concerned that Chinese gains in space exploration and technology will increase that country's influence around the world. Aaron Bateman is a professor at George Washington University and a member of the Space Policy Institute. Bateman suggested that prestige, meaning respect and admiration, plays an important part in space competition. The Moon programs suggest that space is going to be an arena of competition on the prestige front, demonstrating advanced technical expertise and know-how, and then also on the military front as well, Bateman said. A U.S. military-financed study group suggested last month that China appears to be on track to go past the U.S. as the lead space power by 2045. The group's report said China's space effort was part of a plan to spread authoritarianism and communism on Earth. In July, Zhao Lijian, a foreign ministry spokesman, said China's space program was guided by peaceful ideas. Some U.S. officials are constantly smearing China's normal and reasonable outer space undertakings, Zhao said. Flying on the most powerful rocket ever built by NASA, Artemis I aims for a five-week flight that would put test dummies into lunar orbit. If all goes well with that, U.S. astronauts could fly around the moon in 2024 and land on it in 2025. China's space program is behind that of the United States, but its secretive military-linked program is developing fast and creating missions that could make Beijing a leader in spaceflight. Last year, China deployed a rover vehicle on Mars. The U.S. has several such vehicles on the planet. China was also the first of nations to land a spacecraft on the far side of the moon. And Chinese astronauts are close to completing work on a permanent orbiting space station. A 1967 U.N. space treaty bans anyone from claiming control over a moon or planet, putting a military base on it, or putting weapons of mass destruction into space. But space competition is not necessarily a bad thing, said American Senator Chris Coons, a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Space competition does not have to lead to conflict, he said. He added, I think it can be a competition, like the Olympics, that simply means that each team and each side is going to push higher and faster, and, as a result, humanity is likely to benefit. I'm John Russell. Thanks, John. Now, I understand you have a little test for our listeners. I do. Here is a question for you. What does the story suggest is different about current space competition? Is it A, it involves countries that see moon programs as part of a larger plan? Is it B, it is less politically sensitive than it was in the past? Or is it C, it has more involvement on the part of private industry? I believe it is the first choice, A. That is correct. Good work. To answer more questions about John's story, visit our website, learningenglish.voanews.com. VOA Learning English has launched a new program for children. It is called Let's Learn English with Anna. The new course aims to teach children American English through asking and answering questions and experiencing fun situations. For more information, visit our website, learningenglish.voanews.com. From VOA Learning English, welcome to the Making of a Nation, American History in Special English. 
I'm Steve Ember. Today we continue our story of the United States Constitution. In recent weeks, we discussed how the Constitution was written. In the summer of 1787, a group of delegates gathered for a convention in Philadelphia. Their plan was to rewrite the Articles of Confederation. Those articles created a weak union of the 13 states. Instead of rewriting the articles, however, they spent that summer writing a completely new plan of government. On September 17th, after four months of often bitter debate, the delegates finally agreed to the new plan. Now they had to get at least nine of the 13 states to approve it. Delegates to the Philadelphia Convention had met in secret. They wanted to be able to debate proposals and change their minds without worrying about public reaction. Now they were free to speak openly. Each had a copy of the new constitution. Newspapers also had copies. They published every word. Public reaction was great indeed. Arguments for and against were the same as those voiced by delegates to the convention. The Constitution would save the United States. The Constitution would create a dictator. Yale Law School professor Akhil Reed Amar says the public debate about the Constitution was one of its first successes as a democratic document. He notes that even democracies of long ago, like those in Greece or Italy, did not let citizens vote on their constitutions. People could be for the Constitution or against it. No one was shut down. No one was put in prison. If they liked George Washington or they didn't like George Washington, uh, just this proliferation, robust, wide open, uninhibited um, discourse up and down a continent. Supporters of the new constitution understood that to win ratification, they needed to speak out. So a few weeks after the document was signed, they began writing statements in support of the proposed constitution. Their statements appeared first in newspapers in New York. They were called the Federalist Papers. They were published under the name of Publius, but they were really written by three men, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas says he deeply respects the men who wrote the Federalist Papers. These are people who were engaged, who knew the Constitution. Also want you to know, these were not scholars. These were farmers. These were business people. Some of them who had formal education, some who did not. But they cared about this country. Years later, historians said the Federalist Papers were the greatest explanation of the Constitution ever written. But in 1787, they had little effect on public opinion. The debate over the Constitution divided Americans into two groups. Those who supported it were known as Federalists. Those who opposed it were known as Anti-Federalists. The Anti-Federalists were not anti-American. They were governors, heroes of the Revolutionary War, and even a future president. Yet they distrusted the idea of a strong central government. Give too much power to the president, Congress, and the courts, they said, and citizens would no longer be free. They would lose the liberties gained in the war for independence from Britain. Law professor Akhil Reed Amar says, the Anti-Federalists were an important part of the debate and of history. The people who oppose the Constitution think it could be better still. They're not cast out. They become presidents of the United States. 
vice presidents of the United States, justices on the Supreme Court. It's extraordinary how they're kept in the process. There were both Federalists and Anti-Federalists in the Continental Congress. The Congress had few powers, but it was the only central government the 13 states had at that time. It met in New York City. The convention in Philadelphia had sent the Continental Congress a copy of the new Constitution. Within eight days, the Congress agreed that each state should organize a convention to discuss ratification. One by one, the states held those meetings. Delaware was the first state to ratify early in December 1787. All the delegates voted to approve it. Pennsylvania was the next to ratify, also in December. New Jersey ratified the Constitution in December, followed by Georgia and Connecticut in January. That made five states. The Federalists needed just four more to win ratification. Massachusetts voted in early February. Delegates to the state convention wanted the Constitution amended to include guarantees to protect citizens' rights. They agreed to ratify if these guarantees were added later. Maryland ratified the Constitution at the end of April. There, a number of delegates included a letter of protest with their vote. They said, if the plan of government were not amended, the liberty and happiness of the people would be threatened. At the end of May, South Carolina became the eighth state to ratify. Just one more state and the new constitution would become the law of the land. All eyes turned to Virginia. Virginia was the biggest of the 13 states. One-fifth of all the people in America lived in Virginia. The men who attended the ratifying convention were among the most famous names in the nation. James Madison, Patrick Henry, George Mason, James Monroe, Edmund Randolph, and John Marshall. The most famous Virginian, George Washington, stayed at his home, Mount Vernon. All during the month of June, however, writers brought him messages from the convention and carried messages back. Thomas Jefferson was still in Paris, serving as America's representative to France. But others kept him informed of everything that happened at home. Jefferson wrote back that he liked most of the Constitution. But, he said, I do not like the fact that it does not contain a declaration of the rights of citizens. For three weeks, the Virginia delegates argued about the Constitution. By the end of June, they were ready to vote. Patrick Henry, the outspoken anti-federalist, asked to make a final statement. If this convention approves the Constitution, Henry said, I will feel that I fought for good reasons and lost the fight. If this happens... I will wait and hope. I will hope that the spirit of the American Revolution is not lost. I will hope that this new plan of government is changed to protect the safety, the liberty, and the happiness of the American people. Then the convention voted. Virginia approved the Constitution. However, like Massachusetts, it added that the document must include a declaration of rights for the nation's people. Federalists in Virginia thought their state was the ninth to ratify, 
the one that made the Constitution the law of the land. But they soon learned that New Hampshire had ratified a few days earlier. Virginia was number 10. That left three states, North Carolina, Rhode Island, and New York. In a way, New York was the most important of all. If New York refused to join the Union under the Constitution, it would be almost impossible for a central government to rule the nation. The 12 other states would be divided in two, geographically separated by New York State. Alexander Hamilton was a leader of the Federalists. They used their right to filibuster to make many long speeches to delay the vote. They wanted to wait to hear what Virginia would do. Early in July, they got the news. But New York's anti-federalists kept up the fight for three more weeks. It was not until the end of July that New York finally ratified the Constitution. The vote was extremely close, 30 to 27. Like Massachusetts and Virginia, New York demanded a declaration of rights. The long struggle to give the United States a strong central government was over. It took four months to write a new constitution. It took 10 months to ratify it. Yale Law School professor Akhil Reed Amar says adopting the Constitution was, in his words, the most democratic deed in history. For the first time ever in the history of the planet, an entire continent got to vote on how they and their posterity would be governed. And there were lots of exclusions, you know, from our perspective, but we wouldn't exist, you know, as a democratic country, as a democratic world, but for that. The Continental Congress declared that the Constitution would become effective the first Wednesday in March, 1789. The last two states, North Carolina and Rhode Island, did not approve it until many months after that date. Benjamin Rush of Pennsylvania, who had signed the Declaration of Independence, wrote down eight words when he heard that the Constitution had been ratified. It is done, he said. We have become a nation. But before that, the nation's founders had one more question to answer. How would the Constitution guarantee citizens' rights? Delegates at the convention had raised the point many times and several states made protecting citizens' rights a condition for approving the document. 